I was a dirty time drug dealer when I was growing up. The rumour is you purposely sat the other fella in the passenger seat. I pick an hammer up and stove your skull in with it. Like, do you know what love is? You're a scared little man. It doesn't matter how big and strong you are. You're going to be acting like a scared little boy in a flash. If David Regan was here now, what would you say to him? The innocent man that died. There was people cheering, thinking I'd been shot dead in the city of Liverpool. When you think of Liverpool, you might think of the liver bird looking proudly over the Merseyside city skyline. You might think of Premier League team Liverpool FC or sporting heroes like Steven Gerrard. But today's guest paints a different picture. He's lived the life you would normally only see in a Netflix series. It's time to get unchained. Devin G, welcome to the show, bro. And you, Shaq, mate. Nice one for having me. Can we start from the beginning? What was your childhood like? For me, mate, it's not much different from... Thousands of family lives right now, to be honest with you. Five lads, a mum that was pissed all the time, a dad that was never in the picture. When he was in the picture, he was just a violent man. So we end up going down a mad path of crime. From 12 on, we're just destroyed as a, as a family of brothers, separated, thrown into the care system. And then that's it. We just end up becoming very violent criminals and end up on that path of life, which is absolutely traumatic and destructive. What's your first memory of getting into crime? Stealing cars. Right. Where I live, I live in L5, Liverpool 5, and it's like where the Grisdale Estate, where my mum's house was. It's like 400 yards from Liverpool's football ground. And every time there's a home game... You'll have thousands of cars parking outside the match, outside the ground, and we just rob them. Oh. So you mainly targeted people coming from up from London, Liverpool yeah, sports. People coming to watch the football, let's park the cars outside, come back from watching the football and have the windows smashed and everything gone out the cars, and that was us. Which we ain't good, you know, but it was just the way we was, out of school, no no way of earning money, parents that were poor. No one really guiding you. No one garden is nowhere, so we had to find our own little way. And to feed ourselves and dress ourselves, we had to commit crime because we weren't getting fed or dressed properly at home. So we had to use the tactics that we found on the street to earn money, to eat well and dress well. It's just survival mode, really. Survival mode, yeah. But then it goes past survival mode. And then it's the only mode, you know. What was the protagonist for you getting into more serious crime leading up to your prison sentence down the line? Basically, I was led mm. into more dangerous things by adults. Every kid is led into more dangerous situations by adults, regardless mm. of what generation or what year we're in. Even today, 2023, 20, 24, you've got young lads being led astray by adults. The protagonist for me, basically, was financial. Mm. I just needed money. Mm. I needed to fit in with the crowd. I'm dressed like a scruff. They're dressed like the rich. I mm. need to be fitting in with them. So the majority of my crime was for food and clothes. As you're going through, you start getting deeper. You start getting gamer. You start getting more risky. You start taking bigger risks with your freedom. And then the gamer you become, the more of a reputation you get. Mm. The more gamer you come, the more notorious you're becoming. And it sort of just keeps you on that path of everyone's respecting me now. If they're not respecting me, the shit's scared of me. And it gives you this ideology that you're untouchable. You just end up on a mad path. And you get that untouchable sense from like 15, 16, 17. If it's something you don't want to get into, that's absolutely fine. But, um, what sort of treatment did you go through as a child? Um, what was your relationship like with your father? And it was just beatings, mate. Mm. There was no uh, there was no father father son relationship, if you like. There's five boys, and every one of us took a good eye off my half fella. So there was no there was no love lost when he died. If mm. you understand what I'm saying, he was he was he was just a brutal. Alcoholic, heavy-handed mm. man, big-boned, stocky individual who used to come down London 
used to work in London on the roofs, then come back home, batter us, batter me mum, and fuck back off to London. So that that was our lifestyle, basically tied to the bed, whipped with a belt, starved, right. kicked out in the freezing cold, just all all the usual stuff that you get as a kid. Well, in my in my mind, it's normal. There's you thought car- this was normal that everyone else goes through these sort of things? I believe there's thousands of kids going through exactly what I went through with my dad right now. Right now. Definitely. Without a shadow of a doubt. Do you think that support system has improved nowadays or? For who? For the children that are going got through it. got worse. Yeah, it's got a lot worse. Ten times worse. So on my estate, um, if I was kicked out by my ma, I could go to my neighbour Pat. And mm. she'd take me in and make me warm and feed me and make sure I weren't sleeping on the streets. Kids haven't got that these days. The community's just... There's no community mm. there no more. Everyone's... No one trusts anyone within your community no more. Do you think that experience brought you closer to your to your brothers who were they no. going through now? Okay. We, we were deliberately parted as kids. Okay. You know, the social services system disrupted our childhood. They just pushed us out all over the city. So you couldn't even, you know, we were in put, a family your, put your head on We've each other's been... shoulders sort of thing like we're going through this together. It's just, no, just we me and Danny, separated. Me and Danny went into care together, so we went through a madness together, me and Danny. Mm. But even later on in life, like from the ages of, what, 26, I haven't seen Danny, which was 18 years ago. Do you think all of these experiences have... Um affected your outlook on life how you see things like love friendship trust yeah like do you know what love is i don't think i've experienced love to know what love is Mm. i love things yeah so i know what it's like to love things Mm. But I don't know what it's like to feel loved, if that makes sense. Right. And I guess it's the same with friendship and things and trusting people as well. I don't trust no one now. That's one thing that's happened to me. I mm. don't trust no one. I don't have people that hang on around me. Mm. I don't I don't mix with no one. Mm. No one. No I've no one. I've noticed that myself, like uh, speaking to you over, you know, TikTok and you leave everything to the last minute. That's just the way I am. That's not mm. being like that since a kid though. Mm. You know, it's not all of a sudden, oh, I'm scared you might be setting me up. But I'm not going to walk into something blind where I'm being set up without taking a little bit of precaution. And the one thing I can take is, you know, not telling you exactly where I'm going to be at exactly that time. And that's all to do with everyone. So the way you've been, I'm panicking here. Mm. I've had people having come, da, 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 da. you're meant to be on the train, da, 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 da. I'm, t- I'm thinking, of, I've told you three days ago, kid, don't worry. Mm. I'm definitely coming. Take me word for it. Mm. But because you've been let down, you're not trusting my word. And that's basically what I do. That's quite interesting. I, I've shown similar sort of distrust. You've done exactly what I was doing in the beginning. Mm. Before I went deep with the distrust, you're just starting to distrust now mm. due to what your experience. experiences. Yes. So you've probably had a few people who said, yeah, definitely 10 o'clock on Saturday. I'm definitely going to leave shit on you. Mm. Now, here you are, you've got a decent person telling you, don't worry. I'm definitely being there for the interview, blah, blah, blah. But because them other rats have shit on you, you're automatically going into my situation with me as if I'm going to shit on you. Mm. And it's the same. That's what I do now. Because I've been shit on a lot, I don't give people the opportunity to shit on me. Mm. It's your experiences just seem to shape you. It's only your experience in your situation that does shape you. It's only off that sort of stuff that you're building your character. Mm. So when you're 40 years old and you've got this character about you, it will have been the previous 40 years that's made you into that character. Mm. And depending on how you handle it and how you conduct yourself in them situations, depending on what character you turn out to be like. You have lived quite a traumatic life and one of the most traumatic experiences, I believe, was possibly the the passing of your brother, Billy. Yeah, Billy, yeah. Billy. Would you mind going through that whole experience, how it happened, what led up to it? Well, Billy, Billy's had tendencies since we were kids. I think we've all had tendencies. What I mean by tendencies, I'm speaking of suicidal tendencies, you mm. know, where you can't be asked, you mm. want to take someone's life or take your own, them sort of tendencies. Fucking, the most of his problems always being down to cocaine abuse on girls. 
they seem part of the same problem. If you're a coke head, you've got a girl that's swatting your head alongside the coke, and it, the come down has a massive impact. The more you do it, the deeper the come down. Mm. And there's not a lot of people that can survive them come down. So that's why you're hearing a whole awful lot of people dealing with them suicidal tendencies that Billy's been dealing with. I've been dealing with them since I was a kid myself. So the first time Billy's ever tried to tuck his life, he shot himself in the head with a catalyzer gun. One of his best mates at the time, he's phoned me and said, I'm worried about your brother. I said, I buy your Billy. I said, why, what's up? He said, he's just rang me and said, this is the last time you're going to see him. Mm. So I'm only a few streets away from his house. Run down to his house. And his blind is shut because we're a bit concerned anyway about his tendencies. So when he's saying shit like that, you need to go and check it out just in case he does do fucking something daft. So as I've got to his front door, I've had to look through his letterbox and he's lying on the couch where he's blasted himself in the head with this catalyzer gun. He's just dangling off the couch with blood, blood pissing out of his head, mumbling with a Kirk Cobain song in the background on repeat. And that's how Kirk Cobain went out. Yeah. So, uh, Nirvana, I think it was, on repeat. Mm. So I've had to kick his door in. I've kicked his door in. And um, I've had to try and keep him away. Because there was a firearms used, the IRV wouldn't let the ambulance in. It was a miracle that he survived. He was in Mm. a coma for three and a half years. He's got through it. But he came out of it with the worst form of epilepsy. He had to operate on his head and take a big lump of his brain out. And then he was going through his life, still abusing drugs, having all these fits, deteriorating every time. And then I get me jail, and then I've got like six months left of my prison sentence before I'm released, and he hangs himself in my ma's house. So he just tops himself in my mum's house. And where was you when this happened? I had six months to get out of custody. So you're still inside? And- I'm still in jail, coming to the end of my 18-year prison sentence, yeah. So at the beginning of my sentence, my dad was a knobhead, you know, I broke his jaw when I was old enough to break his jaw, you know, damaged them. So he died when I was on remand for con- conspiracy to murder. In the first two years, my half fella died. Now, although I didn't get eye to eye with him, he was still my half fella and I still had the human right to attend his funeral. Mm. So I put the application in to attend the funeral as you do. They never let me go to my dad's funeral. They didn't funeral. let you go? Nah, saying I'm an escape risk and the safety of their officers who escort me to the funeral. Mm. That's why you're not having it. So I thought, oh, well, you can't argue with the system. But it was a human right. They should have took me to my dad's fucking funeral, but they never. So it is what it is. But exactly the same reasons they used whilst I was on remand for my dad, 11 and a half years later, mm. They used exactly the same reasons on why I couldn't go to my brother's funeral. Why would they think you're a flight risk? When Have you ever tried to... I it was just the police mm. with a problem against me and they were just trying to make it as difficult as they could. If Billy was here right now, what would you say to him? Leave the drugs alone. Simple as that. Simple as that. Stop sniffing the cocaine. Mm. It's making you depressed. It's making you anxious. And it's putting you on a downer Mm. for weeks. Mm. And you can't handle it. Leave the cocaine alone. Because there's enough families absolutely destroyed and ripped apart by people that abuse the substances, eventually unliving themselves. So do you think this is the reason why you are so against... You know, drug I've dealers. had too many. I've had look. I was a cunt when mm. I was growing up. I was I was a dirty, dying, fucked up drug dealer when I was growing up. Mm. You know, I shifted a lot of drugs in the city of Liverpool, mm. and it's the worst thing I could have fucking done, because the amount of families I've destroyed through my actions, through my greed, the amount of crime, the amount of trauma that I've vibrated right through the city of Liverpool on my actions. And then I get out, I lose my brother, and I'm saying I lost him because of cocaine abuse. I've seen, I've lost, I've had two brothers fuck their lives up because they start smoking crack. I've lost mates through drugs. I've had mates shot dead through drug dealing. So everything I look at to do with drugs indicates to me that it's the number one problem on our streets, regardless of what your age is. The number one risk to you and your family within your community 
are the drug dealers and the people that peddle them. Mm. And that's why you get a lot of backlash from the criminals mm. that I used to mix with, that I used to call friends. Do you understand? Them same people, them same friends from when I was younger are now arch enemies of mine and mm. have tried to kill me a few times. Before I went down this route of choose a life, not a knife. What the lads don't understand in that world is they're not strangers that come and kill you. They're your own associates that come and kill you in that game. Mm. You know, it's not strangers that fuck your life up in that game. It's the people you know in that game that's fucking your life up. Mm. So you can ask anyone that's gone to jail for gang crime. You can ask anyone that's gone to jail for drug wars or any bullshit like that, and they will tell you. I used to be a mate with that kid when we were 12. I used to be a mate with them when we were 15. We split up and started arguing, and there's only one reason why a kid at the bottom of your street is now looking to kill a kid who lives at the top of your street, and it's drugs and the culture that surrounds it, that gang culture. It gives me more impetus. It gives me more fire in what I'm doing by screaming about this drug deal and pandemic that we're going through. And because we've been dealing with it for decades and decades, everyone's sort of just as part of normal life. Now, you've got parents that think, oh, the 16-year-olds experiment with drugs until they're 19 and they leave it alone. It's not like that no more, mm. do you understand? If I was experimenting with a drug years ago, I could have it and go, I don't want this. Mm. The drugs these days, once you've had it, it's making you want it. Mm. That's what they're designed to do these days. Back in the day, you could have a, you could have ecstasy, and you could either like it and choose to have another one, or dislike it and choose not to have it. These days, if you have a line of cocaine, you can't choose not to have it. Bad Is it kind of like being laced with other things nowadays? Yeah. The majority of the shit that the people are consuming these days, whether it's heroin, cocaine, ketamine, MDMA, cannabis, it's all synthetic. Mm. All of it. It's all chemical. It's very rare you're getting the potent fucking seed of what you're looking for, whether it's opium, whether it's coca, whether it's cannabis. The majority of the shit that the kids are consuming these days, and the adults, is synthetic. Mm. It's not natural. It's not the real product. You've brought up uh, Choose a Life, Not a Knife. I yeah. understand that's your movement. Um and you've been speaking about this and shouting about this for many years now. Years, mate. Coming up to coming up to ten years now. How's that movement going? Have you, has people you know, started to help you and get this message out? It's not that type of movement to be approachable, if you like. The way it's gone, I haven't handled it. It's handled me. So initially, it was suicide prevention. Choose a life, not a knife. I was mm. thinking about self harming. Swerved it because of the title. Choose a life, not a knife. It went into the knife shit that's been going on in our estates. Mm. From the knife stuff, it's gone into the gun crime. Mm. From the gun crime, it's gone into the gang crime. From the gang crime, it's gone into the people that are responsible for all the gang crime on our streets, the drug dealers and the organised crime groups that lavishly live in our communities while families are being destroyed and ripped apart. Um, I've had my own experiences as well. One of my friends, his name was Adnan Patel, and he was just, um, he approached some drug dealers who were selling his little brother um, weed and he wanted to tell them to stop selling drugs to his little brother and they ended up stabbing him in the heart, you know, over, over nonsense. And um, it's definitely an, an epidemic in our country. We see it all the time, you know, clips in London, in Liverpool, in Manchester and other areas, you know, kids walking around with Rambos on them. What goes through, you know, a child's mind to pick up a knife? It's experience. If I purchase a knife and it's two inches and I think I'm brave with this knife, that's two inches. But mm. then my man who's got more experience carrying a knife has now got a seven inch blade. Mm. And if he pulls that out against my two inch blade, I'm fucked. Mm. So that's where the ideology is, the bigger the better. So really, they're scared little boys. They're all scared. And that's mm. why they carry a knife in the first place. But mm. it's what they're scared of. Regardless if they're scared little boys, you'll get scared little men. Mm. If they were put in the same situation as that boy. Mm. You know, if you've got a man or a boy with a 20-inch Rambo knife coming at you, you're a scared little man. It doesn't matter how big and strong you are, you're going to be acting like a scared little boy in a flash. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? Mm. So, so if the council came to you and said, look, okay, we hear what you're saying. We want you to 
be the man to sort this problem out. How would you do it? I'm not the man to sort this problem out alone. Hypothetically, if I was given the authority off a council somewhere to take this initiative and make it fucking work, mm. it, it definitely can. The first thing I'll be looking on doing is looking at the other initiatives in the area mm. and trying to align everyone to come together and work with the same cause. Mm. Because at the moment you've got that initiative over there and that initiative there and the whole purpose basically, you've got very sound, positive, community-inspired people that want to do good, but then you've got money-led people. Mm -hmm. And the whole incentive of that initiative is to make it into a CIC, community project, mm. which is official, so they can start bringing money in and getting money in on the back of it and money in on the back of this. My message has never had that. It's never registered. I've tried it, but I've, I've always been financially inept to do it. I can't... Turn it into a... Because you need all these mad things to... You need a support instigate. system around Basically, you. Basically, yeah. you need someone that knows what to do. If no one's supporting you, then you're just a lone man. I'm a one-man band. Yeah, one-man band. Just, but the only way I can do it, the only way I can raise awareness is by being very vocal and factual about what the fuck's happening on our streets. Mm. And I know it works. Yeah. You've only got to look at my life. If choose a life, not a knife, has made me turn my life around 180 degrees... I've gone from 35 years of deep, deep crime to not committing a single offence ever again, not even living off the finance. You know what I'm saying? Alhamdulillah, yeah. I, I don't go near none of it. What you need to grasp and you need to understand now is the fact that every young kid that's carrying a blade now is inspired to carry a firearm later on. Mm. That's the way it works on the streets. If you've got 100 kids carrying a five-inch bladed article now and they're all 15, by the time the 100 kids are 20, 30 of them are lifed off or 30 of them have gone into some fucked-up madness because they've started participating in violent crime with firearms and drugs. And and it's fact. So all this country's doing at the moment is breeding inmates, jail bait. Every council estate up and down the United Kingdom, you can look at them and you can say, that kid's going to be in jail, that kid's going to be in jail, and that kid's going to be... You can identify the kids that are going to go into the justice system and you can identify them early. So if us on the community can identify an age category that's definitely going to go into the justice system, why can't they identify it? You know, if someone that's living on universal credit on a, in a house on, on the Grisdale estate, if he can look out of his window and go, that kid's jailbait, that kid's jailbait, that kid's jailbait, why can't a policeman or a probation officer do it? Is it possible that maybe they want that? Um, this is the point to make. I've heard you say in one of your um, lives, if the justice system was taken out, the whole economy would collapse? Yeah, definitely. Just think of how many people are employed in the justice system. Look how many prisons are in this country aligned to the justice system. Police stations, court officials, youth centres. Imagine all that gone. There's a massive void there mm. in a anyone's economy. You're going to lose up to 300, 400, half a billion, half a million jobs. Easy. Mm. That's on the front line. Do you understand what I'm saying? The impetus was years ago, if I was arrested as a kid, they'd want to rehabilitate me. Mm. And they'd want me to do that one sentence and never go back. It's not that now. No, rehabilitation has gone out the fucking window. Once you've got a prison number attached to your birth certificate, when you go into custody, you get a P-nomus, and that number stays with you from the get-go. It's called a prison number. I've had the same number since I was 14, and it's still there now. You're like a barcode. It's like a barcode. It's a number. That's, it's like your birth certificate code. It's exactly the same thing. So your birth certificate is basically your registration into the education system. When you go into the prison system, you've got the same sort of process. A document is your way into the prison system. In 2004, um, an innocent man named David Regan was murdered. Yeah. And in 2006, you were... Uh, sentenced to 18 2007. years. 2007. 2007, yeah. you were convicted. I was due a big one. You know, I was due a big one multiple times. Do you understand? I was just getting acquitted, 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 acquitted. So I was due a big one. How did you get entangled in, in this? We started selling drugs. 
the old school didn't like it. And when we didn't take drugs off them, they tried to shut us down. We fought back with them. And then it just escalated from there. So you had a gang of millionaires from Liverpool who were like 40, 41. And then you had us who were 21, 22. And we weren't doing as we were told by them. Mm. So they wanted to get rid of us and shut us down. Is it true that it was um, a retaliation? Because we're not playing ball with these old school and we're doing our own thing and we're, we're offending all the drug dealers in the area and all the, mm. the old, uh, you know, the ones that had it boxed. Yeah. We're offending them, so they're trying to shut us down. How they try and shut us down is by killing the main man out of the group, and that was me. So on the 6th of April 2004, they came to kill me dead, but fucked it. And ended up killing the kid who was with me, little Craig. He was only 18 years old. Craig Barker, yeah. wasn't it? So they've shot him dead with this Darren Waterhouse, an SAS soldier, Goldstream Guard. But I survived the attack. And they weren't expecting me to survive. You know, there was people cheering, thinking mm. I'd been shot dead in the city of Liverpool, but I'd survived it. And then within a month, the person that's tried to kill me has got onto me and told me my man was driving a vehicle, David Regan. So I've believed the kid who's tried to kill me and went for the kid who never. That kid who tried to get me killed was banging this kid's wife for years and years and years. So he's put us on him. We mm. took him out, which makes it clear for him. So it's a dirty trick. So basically on the 6th of April, we just get pounced on by this soldier. He attacks the passenger seat, puts nine bullets in me mate's chest. Then bullets that go through his chest, come out his chest and go into me little brother that was driving the car. So all the bullets go right through him and into me little brother. A few ricochet around the car and if the kid who sat next to me, not in touch as me. I get me mates to the hospital and that's it. A month later, I've had this kid put in my mind, this David Regan. So 18th of May, get two cars, get the thing with a silencer on it. <laughs> Take a little 15-minute drive, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, summer's day, very busy. Had a car wash, just pulled up the car wash, ba 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 bam done him, got off. Two days later, got arrested, went into custody. So it was actually you that done the shooting? Well, no, I, it was conspiracy to murder. Right. I conspired with A, B, C, D, E, five of us. 28 week trial, hung jury, two cold D's get acquitted, retrial for me and the other two. Mm. Next trial, 18 week trial, the prosecution stopped the case at the end of the prosecution case because they'd let a witness in they shouldn't have mm. against me. So they severed me. From the other two Codies, they continued with the same jury. I'm out now of that trial, I've got my own one to come. They get acquitted. So now I'm on a trial by myself, conspired with others unknown, because all my Codies are being acquitted. Mm. But I got convicted on hearsay. Oh, man. So I got an 18-year prison sentence <sighs> under the old law, which means, you know, you can, you can get parole at 9, 10, 11... If not, you've got the release date at 12. Yeah, because I was thinking, I was reading the story that um, 18 sounds a lot, but when you consider that someone's life was lost... Yeah, it's not. It's not a lot. If my understanding is correct, if it was a year later, it happened. Because my crime was 2004. In 2005, they brought the Goodyear rulings out. So my offence of conspiracy to murder, pre-2005, carried the sentence of discretionary life mm. or a long determinant. After 2005, my offence, standard 35 rec. So just one year and you could still be sitting in jail right I was now. getting told right through the process, I'm getting a 30 to 35 rec. Man. That's why I went not guilty. I had fuck all to lose. You see all these kids getting dragged through the system now and the bangs are right, but they're still going not guilty and they're still dragging the parents through a fuck or shit heap. And the reason they're doing that is because they've got fuck all to lose. Mm. Go for it, anything can happen. And that's the mindset. And that's what your barristers tell you. You know, it's the legal advice that makes you go not guilty. So the legal advice I was getting off my QC is this is borderline contract killing, which holds a 30 to 35 rec. Now, the judge shocked everyone when he said he sentenced me under the old law. So when I was found guilty after the third trial... It was you shocked as well? Yeah. I'm expecting to stand up and get 30. And he's turned around, I'm going to sentence you under the old law. So I was like, wow. 
It's kind of weird. You've been sentenced to 18 years, but there's this weird. happy feeling. Look, it was boss. You can, you can imagine the weight you're carrying. Mm. You can imagine how heavy that is, carrying that for two and a half years. Yeah. I'm on my man for two and a half years. Mm. All the, all the conspiracy to supply firearms, conspiracy to supply class A drugs, conspiracy to blackmail. I got not guilties on all of them. Mm. And there was 10 times more evidence on them mm. than what there was on the conspiracy to murder. Got acquitted on 12 indictments, all naughty charges, which would have fucking finished me. Mm. And then got guilty on the one with the less evidence, which was the conspiracy to murder. I've heard a rumour, and I just want you to, you know, clear it up. The attack was aimed at you, right? Yeah. They wanted to kill you. Yeah. The rumour is you purposely sat the other fella in the passenger seat. I didn't know anyone was going to kill me. The kid that was with me came voluntary and he loved being with us and that's mm. why he came with us that day. The only reason I swapped the seat with him is because the, the galaxy that we bought the day, that same day mm. had monitors in the headrest and you could have a PS2 rigged up to it and you could play on the computer. It's the, mm. only, the only reason me and Craig changed seats. Right, so there was a swapping of seats then? It was one minute before the shooting. So I if you didn't swap seats, it would have been you? Oh, yeah, it would have been me, yeah. Man. But that weren't deliberate. I didn't know I'm going to go out of here and get shot, so you get in the passy. It's just nonsense then? It's just bullshit, lads. It's, it's, it's complete fucking nonsense. The bottom line is little Craig always used to come with us. He weren't a criminal. I used to put money in his bedroom. Mm. That's it. You know, like 20 grand, 30 grand, when it needed to go somewhere before, and it just just sit in his bedroom. That's it for 18-year-old teenage lad. Good yeah. as gold. Lovely young man. And his life taken by dirty, fucked-up drug dealers who were trying to kill me. An 18-year sentence. Yeah, I understand you spent around 12, 12 and a half years of that. That's a still a long... 12. 12 years. That's still a long time. What are the worst things you've seen happen in prison? What's going on in there? I've seen... People's skin falling off them because of hot oil. I've seen flapping, you know, where they've been gashed and the, the skin's just flapping away. I've I've seen madness in prison, mate. Sounds like hell. It is hell. You know, you've got to think, there's a reason prison is there for society is to take everyone who's dangerous or horrible mm. off the streets, take them away from society because it's fucking messy. If you can put yourself in a frame where you, you're going into... A house with 60 people living in it. 40 of them people have murdered someone. Mm. Some with firearms, some with blades, some with blunted instruments. You know, savage violence. I can pick a gun up now and bang you in the head. I'm not a violent individual. I've just lost my temper. Mm. Do you understand? If I pick an hammer up and fucking stove your skull in with it, you're going to know I'm a violent individual. Do you understand mm. what I'm saying? Just because that little rat with that firearm has just got a 30 wreck doesn't mean he's a violent individual. I admit, gonna... there's been times in my life I've, I've thought to myself, if I've had a pistol or something on me, you know, I might be in jail myself. You, you're going to be frustrated. You have, your anger's gone yeah. out. You just went out and went, Rah! Yeah, give but it 24, it... 48 hours. But because... You know, you feel all right again. You moved on. Yeah, but because, because it's a violent offence, mm. automatically mm. you're violent. I think that's where America... America's right. fucked. Yeah. <laughs> America's just fucked, mate. America's yeah. always been fucked. America's ideology, the way they... It's just fucked America. Mm. And what you're seeing is all the shit things that's happening in this country is come from America. Come from there. And you're seeing it more so now with all these drill artists starting to wear red ribbons and blue ribbons and thinking in the cribs and the bloods. What do you think about drill artists that it's are talking bullshit. about... And then everyone that's speaking that type of shit, trying to encourage kids to go that town, that, these are all knobheads. I don't give a fuck what, what part of the country you're from. If you're speaking that drill, the majority of the time, you've never lived a fucking life. I'm listening to Scouse kids on this drill and they're speaking fucking madness, but you know, mm. you've never led that life properly. Mm. Do you understand? If I'm an artist and I'm quite well known, and I start speaking about plunging people and taking the throat out and cutting the Achilles heels off and all this mad shit. I've got a generation of kids listening to my words, taking them on board, spitting them, trying to live them, trying to whack them. Mm. And that's all these drill artists are doing, exactly what hip-hop done to the American communities in the 80s 
drill is doing to the UK communities in the 2000s. Exactly what hip hop was used for in America, in mm. the black communities. Drill is being used in the UK yes. for the white and black communities. It's just destroying yeah. the minds of the youth yeah. before they've even got going. And it's gearing them up for prison. And like I said earlier on, you've got two systems. You've got the education system or the justice system. And if you don't conform to the education system, it's guaranteed your kid is going into the justice system. It's the only two options we've got in this country for the youth. Mm. Education system, prison system. You decide what one you're going in. If you fuck up in the education system, they'll put you in the middle lane for a little bit, see if they can get you back into the education system. But mm. once they realise you're gone from the education system, you are going into the justice system. Mm. Fact. Mm. And the younger you are, the quicker it happens. I've never really if, thought of it like that. If you're that, 14 yeah. years old and you fuck up in mainstream school and, and you keep on fucking up, they'll give you your warnings, they'll give you your detention, then they'll suspend you, mm. then they won't have you back, and then you'll go into a problem school. You can't go into the mainstream because you can't handle it or you're too mm. naughty or you're too loud or whatever. So we're putting you into the trouble school. Mm. And when this kid goes into the trouble school, he's now in a class of 60 troubled kids. Mm. It doesn't fix him. Makes him worse, makes him more aggressive, makes him more uncontrollable within the communities. And before you know it, mm. he's lost all respect for adults because he's been getting treated like shit in this school of adults. Mm. In prison, who's running the prison system right now? So if you, if you think about it, for years and years and years, the prison system went through a process and you'd always had the top dogs in there and you'd always had the, the and this, this, and you'd had them in that area, them... You know, and for years and decades and decades, that was established and you'd have the top dogs on the wing and they could say A, B and C and A, B and C would be done. But now what you've got is a little shit with a spike addiction that'll sneak up on this top dog on his landing and slash the fuck out of his face. Mm. So no one's got any authority now mm. because anyone can get you cut. Mm. So it's like it's all loose now. But the dynamics you're speaking about... Is I'll tell you straight, mate. The number one strength within the prison system is Islam. For multitude of reasons. Strength in numbers. That's what jail is. Mm. Strength in numbers. And you've described how scary it could be. Because as you said, not everyone is uh, built for that. Maybe they, you know, picked up a gun or a weapon and, yeah, and done something out of frustration, at, um, a moment of madness. But in general, maybe that isn't their lifestyle. So they, they life, end up in this place with real, you know, tough nut guys. Real certified, scary fuckers, <clears throat> mate. I just picture myself, maybe if I ended up in that position, maybe I would be looking to, you know, join a group where I could feel protected. Is that the sort of thing that happens? Yeah. And this is the way I like to put it. You've got reverts, then you've got converts. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm. So you've got like proper reverts that need purpose, that need direction, need a belief system, mm. need something to direct them, to keep them strong through the process that they're going through. And a lot of them will find Islam. And the way, you know, there's... Yeah, so look, I was looking at reverting. Oh, you was? Yeah, years and years and years ago. There's a few things why I didn't. Mm. But I, I was looking at reverting due to what I was witnessing. I didn't want to be... I, I went reverting to be a part of the gang. Mm. And early 2000s, when it first kicked in, like the Muslim thing, a lot of people were just converting mm. to be part of the gang. Mm. And people who had mad offences would convert mm, for, for protection. That protection and people who had problems with other people over whatever they'd convert for that line of protection in the system mm. but I was looking at the character and the conduct of the people that was reverting mm. and how the jail weren't bothering them and the majority of them would put the tellies outside the cell so you couldn't be controlled by the authorities. And I was looking at all this thinking, that's exactly the way I fucking think. Mm. <laughs> so I'm looking at all these Muslim brothers who I'm, I'm training with, I eat with, and I'm just looking at everything and I'm thinking, that's like me, that's like me, that's like me. 
if there was anyone ready to revert, it was fucking me. Do you mm. understand what I'm saying? Mm. But my solidarity and my loyalty to the spirit of Christ always stopped me from turning the page, if you like. Mm. Always. And I think I said to you earlier on, I said, um, for someone like me, violent, notorious, anti-establishment, anti-police, if I'm in that system, thoroughbred Catholic, rah, mm. and then all of a sudden, three years into my sentence, I'm going... I want to be a Muslim. The way they look at that is shit. Mm. He's only become a Muslim What's to be up? extreme. Yeah. And da, 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 He's da, up da. to something, yeah. So it damages his progress in the prison. Mm. My younger brother, Danny, he reverted. I was going to get into that, yeah. So your brother did revert. Yeah, yeah. my younger brother, Danny, converted. The last, the last time I knew he was a Muslim. Was he a revert or convert, like how you put it? No, with, with Danny. Danny's notorious. Danny's locking wings down since he was 15. Mm. You know, he's a naughty prisoner. And what he says fucking goes mm. when he was on that page. When he became Muslim, he completely changed his page. You know, he weren't wanting to control wings. Mm. Do you understand? So what I like to say about Islam is this, and I'll always say it, is you can have a confused, angry, fucked up, with no direction, no confidence and no security about himself, individual, who's just going through bullshit as a Christian, not practising, all of a sudden meets Islam. Mm. All of a sudden, within six months, you haven't got a confused, insecure, angry, frustrated knobhead now you've got a secure, confident young man who knows what the fuck he wants in life. Mm. And I've seen that happen with loads of reverts. Converts are just a little shithouse rats that are bringing dirt upon the name of Islam within the system. Mm. And they get terrored by proper Muslims, these rats. Mm. They're just trying to use the They're using yeah, the name the of Islam as mm. a form of protection mm. and they bring shame to it. And that's one thing you've got to admire about Islam is the loyalty towards each other, yep. the solitude, the solidarity. You've, yep. got, you've got to admire regardless of where the fuck you're from. And, and Islam doesn't give two fucks about your skin colour nope. or where you're from or no. whatever. You, yeah. can, you can be as black as the fucking night or as white as the light. Do you understand yep. what I'm saying? Yeah. You're embraced in that culture. It's not to do with race. Mm. But what you've got is you've got a lot of horrible little cunts that go into prison latch on to the stigma, come across as if they're practising Islam correctly, mm. and then the minute they get out of prison, fuck it all off. Yeah, They've used it, abused it, they don't need it now, they're back out. Mm. And they'll do all the haram shit again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they'll get nicked again, go back in and go, oh, do you think Muslim that's Muslim again. Do you think that's still happening now? That still happens. That's guaranteed still happens, mate. Mm. I know crazy nonsense, yeah. and I mean serious nonsense from the city of Liverpool, mm. That have only converted to Islam to be protected whilst in custody. You see, and that's wrong. That, that, that's completely wrong. As a, as a Muslim, like I it's was, wrong. If, if if the brothers in in prison now, you know, uh, if this is happening and they know it's happening, it's wrong. You know, you need to find a better system to you know find out if this person is genuine or not. Right, but what happens is, and, and you've, it is what it is. You've just got to appreciate how they come across. With the bottom line is, the minute you revert. All your all your bad deeds and all your fucking madness is just, and you've got a clean slate. Yep. And regardless of what you've done, you've got the clean slate. Mm. If you fuck it up, you fuck it up. Mm. These kids that are getting the clean slates are thanking the lucky fucking stars mm. that there's a religion called Islam in prison. What these little rats do is, because now they're in the knowledge that they're protected by, say, my man, mm. who's the head of the Muslim Brothers in this prison. Mm. He's now rubbing it in the faces. So you can get dickheads that have been on the list to be damaged for a while and they're just waiting for them to land. But mm. they land as Muslim now. Mm. So they can't be touched. Mm. But the cunts rubbing it in the faces. Do you understand? Yeah. Provoking it, provoking it, provoking it. Eventually, this group that's had a problem with this kid before he was a Muslim just go, fuck the fact he's a Muslim. Mm. Bang. You shit on us. It's not you're a Muslim. You've shit on us. We don't give a fuck if you become a Muslim. 
you're being hurt. But my man, the shit also run back. Mm. They've done you in because I'm a Muslim. Mm. No, they've done you in because you're a fucking scumbag, not to do with your religion. Now you're They're trying using, to play both sides. Now you're using it as if it's your religion while you've been, you've had it riding. Mm. Not to do with your fucking religion. Mm. But you can't get past it once it's started. Mm. And it, within the prison system, the, you know, the Muslims were taken over and it was only the Scousers that weren't, wouldn't allow it. Mm. And that's where it kicked in. And it weren't, it weren't the fact of, let's all hate Muslims here. Mm. Do you understand? It was a fact, hang on. These aren't taking the piss out of Scousers. Mm. Scousers are getting hurt all over the fucking place. Do you think you're going to get away with it when you come to Franklin? Mm. So a Scousers being damaged in Whitemore, all of a sudden a few kids from that area practising event ended up in Franklin and boom, they've been rushed. Before you know it, instead of it being like a gang thing, it's a Muslim thing and a Christian thing or a Scouse thing or a mm. non-believer thing. They make a, a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah. It's fucking madness. But right through the process, right through my prison, you've always had, in any jail, someone that sits at the height of the mast. I've, I've been in where they've, they've issued fatwas. Mm. So you'll have a disturbance in Whitemore with a few Scousers and a few Muslim brothers. And the main men, say Chaos or someone, in Whitemore would put out the prison system. Mm. Fatwa on my man. What you're talking about is the message gets out and then people put in for a transfer to that place. You know what yeah. a fatwa is, isn't it? Mm. It's an Islamic price on your fucking head, basically, basically. isn't it? Yeah. If you cut a Muslim brother in Whitemore and then you get shipped out to fucking wherever, wherever, you're not safe. Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying? You'll get caught for the minute you land in there. Mm. Unless you go to Franklin, you won't be damaged because it's full of scousers. Mm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Staying on, you know, your life um, and going back to what led you to do this 12-year sentence in prison, if David Regan was here now, what would you say to him? The innocent man that died. Sorry. Doesn't hold much weight these days, the word sorry, because people use it without the true intentions for it. Mm. But if he had the opportunity to say sorry sincerely, I would do. Mm. Obviously, I'm not going to. And I've tried to reach out to individuals around and to say, look, let's try and put this in the past. I know it's hard. Mm. We both lost in this situation. Yeah. I've moved forward. While you are living in the past, you're just torturing yourselves. But you, you don't listen. You know, they're still involved in committing drug dealing and crime, and I've completely left that. Mm. So they're never going to get past it mm. because they're not wanting to. I've got past it because I want to. Yeah. Although you've reformed your life from a negative one to a positive one, over the years you've accumulated many enemies yeah. who are out to get you. May Allah protect you, but if worse comes to worse and that does happen, what would be your words to the world? Choose a life, not a knife. Don't fuck your life up the way I did. Don't end up in a gutter the way I have. Don't be incarcerated for the majority of your life like a dickhead the way I was. Mm. Choose a life, not a knife. Live it easy and live it nice. Don't be living it hard and on a fucking prison yard. And we'll wrap it up there. Darren G, thanks for joining me, bro. Sounds it's been a pleasure. I mean, there's so much more we could have got into, so hopefully yeah, next time. Have. If you want to do a part two and make it more political or something, yeah. then we'll do it. Thank you anyway, anyway yeah, Shaq. Yeah. Choose a life, well, good not brother. a life, people. Choose a life, not a life. You heard it here. That's it, mate.